Now, if, a, if a guy with an undergraduate degree, even if it is an experimental theater, um, can't follow a linear argument, what made you think that semi-literate Chinese would be able to follow a linear logical argument? This is David Ross, and welcome again to the Lions War Podcast. Um, as usual, responding to stuff that's going on around me. Um, if you belong to either my real Kung Fu application group or another group, an excellent group on the um, Facebook called the Fajin Project, which is run by Stuart Shaw, um, you might be noticing um, me go after a certain individual. I'm not going to name them on the podcast. I'm not even going to give them the benefit of that kind of exposure. There's no polite, simple way of saying this. He's, he's obviously a compulsive liar. Um, he throws things out, and then when you call them on it, you know, he runs away and doesn't want to deal with it. And, of course, you can't back these assertions up. Again, there's always going to be two kinds of people, though. There's going to be people that you put the facts in front of them, and they're going to logically look at them and assess them and come to a reasonable conclusion based upon the available evidence. And there's going to be people that are going to stick their fingers in the air and go neener, 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 and run off into the sunrise. Um, I don't know if you're fans of the X-File. I used to be like a huge X-Files fan, uh, the original series before they kind of blew it up into nonsense. But, um, uh, you know, that, that thing, the truth is out there. The truth is out there. Truth has been out there for a very long time. I mean, you know, Tung Hao was, was uh, doing the valid real research in the 1930s. Um, it's been out there for a long time, and it continues. And there's just piles of it. There's mountains of it. Of course, Escherich's book, you know, which has just so much useful stuff and so many uh, brilliant insights. Of course, so it's, it's a hard book to get through. So the truth is out there. It's been out there for a long time. My book was a attempt. It's, it's secondary. And again, um, what's interesting is watching people that claim they're academics and not know the difference between a primary source, a secondary source, um, you know, how you validate something, a, a logical argument, um, you know, we were supposed to have done this in high school, remember, you know, um, we took, you know, basic logic classes and people just, I guess, slept through that class or never attended, I, I don't know, you know, I was joking just now with a friend of mine on Facebook that, you know, it's the brown acid thing, you know, I guess they took the brown acid, you know, don't take the brown acid, it's a bad trip, man, but, um, you know, it, I put the book out there so that all the information would be available. Boxers of the Boxer Uprising were not actually martial arts people. Um, they were uneducated, poor peasant youth who believed that by um, writing spells on pieces of paper, burning that piece of paper, and then putting the ashes in water and drinking it, they would be possessed by spirits, and the spirits would then give them martial arts abilities. Um, so, you know, for example, the, the boxers... Um, you know, they, they talk about uh, the monk whose name was Xin Cheng, you know, and he talked about his, his, his ritual. And it, it may seem like it's Iron Body, but it's also this weird, syncretic, you know, combination of things where he's not just talking about qi circulation, which is, you know, uh, Tao Yin, you know, Taoist stuff. But the way that the qi is being circulated is that he's being possessed by Gong Gong, you know, Jin Gong, who is, you know, Vajrapani who is, uh, you know, a, sort of a, a Buddhist saint of sorts, who is actually the patron saint of Shaolin, um, but he's also related to Vajra in the Tibetan esoteric. So you've got a mixture of kind of crazy spirit possession, Taoist qi circulation, um, Mahayana Buddhism, Vajrayana Buddhism to get your iron body. Everyone with real academic training agrees that those books were not written to preserve a martial arts tradition. They were thinly veiled political treaties trying to in, uh, instigate, motivate the hot ethnic Chinese to rebel against the Qing foreign Manchu. So, the only thing thing that we have from the pre-modern era, if you really want to consider the Ming pre-modern, you know, pre-nationalist maybe is the better word. But before the nationalist era, before the late 19th, early 20th century, the only thing that we have 
saying that Cheng Sun Feng was associated with martial arts is a book that was never meant to be a real martial arts book and, and in it you know he, he kind of winks at people and says you know I'm not saying that any of this is true wink wink you know um, it, it, that's not what it was meant for Henning points out that prior to the uh, publication of that book you know epitaph um, there's nothing linking Cheng Sunfeng to martial arts. Anna Sedel, uh, who wrote an article called A, A Taoist Immortal of the Ming Dynasty, Chen Sunfeng, published in 1970, notes that he, it's the use, Henning, same thing Henning does, that conspicuously in all the legends and, and all the biographies of him, and he was a well-known Taoist figure. There's no question that he's a well-known Taoist figure, but there's no mention of martial arts. Again, for a hundred years at least, well-educated historians and political scientists, um, people that read, speak Chinese, people in China, people with access to the archives in Beijing and the archives in Taiwan, have not produced anything prior to the epitaph, which was 1669, linking Chang Sun Feng to martial arts, period. If a, if a guy with an undergraduate degree, even if it is an experimental theater, um, can't follow a linear argument, what made you think that semi-literate Chinese would be able to follow a linear logical argument? But the truth is out there. It really is. And uh, I don't know about anybody else, I'm going to keep presenting it.